What's up everybody and welcome to this RP1 Career Let's Play Kerbal Space Program version 1.8.1 .1. I'm your host Calvin McClure This is a brand new Let's Play and this is my first time producing any video content of any game of any kind I'm by no means a new player to the game I've had careers in 131 and 161 I've been playing since around 1.1.2 or whatever version came before that started playing in stock I think like most people I've been playing in RO and RSS since about 1.2.2 I've landed on the moon I've put rovers on the moon I've made precision landings I've sent probes to Mars and Venus I've sent probes to the Venusian surface I've sent probes to Jupiter game settings as far as funds and science are concerned are on moderate settings everything else is on hard difficulty we're using Kerbalism we're using Principia or Principia whichever way you prefer to say it and though I am a no mean KSP player at all I am however new to those two mods expect mistakes expect learning and more than that expect to have a good time I've always enjoyed seeing other people make good online content I enjoy watching it I've shared quite a bit of my work through the years uh, on Reddit, Calvin underscore McClure. Figured it was time to start and make my own Let's Play, make some YouTube content. I think you'll like it. I know I had a blast producing and making this. If you're looking for a how to get the orbit by 1953, how to land on the moon by 1965 kind of playthrough, this is not the place you're gonna find that. That being said, we're gonna go all out on this playthrough. We're gonna be courageous, we're gonna be bold, we're gonna be brave, but we're gonna be smart about it as well. My play style is really much more of a think it through, take your time, first time right kind of approach. My background in real life is actually engineering. My education is mechanical engineering. So I like to apply as much as I can from that to this game. My hope is that you'll both enjoy the building process as much as I do and maybe, maybe even learn a thing or two. What you saw at the start of the clip were the very first launches of our Silver Brand sounding rocket. The name was inspired by one of the uh, most successful, if not the most successful sounding rocket of all time, the Canadian made Black Brand sounding rocket. But with those early launches and contracts done and out of the way, we're gonna go down the route that I much prefer taking, X-Planes. Flying is something I've done a lot of in KSP. I've built cargo planes, super maneuverable fighters with BD Armory. I find flying in KSP to be actually a lot of fun and quite underrated to be honest. I also happen to find the X-Plane series in real life. I'm talking about the X1, X2, all the way to the legendary X15 to be absolutely fascinating works of engineering so I wanted to go ahead and tackle those in KSP as well. We're going to make replicas, we're going to build our own versions and we're going to go as far and as fast and as high as we possibly can. I want to see how far we can go ahead and push the envelope just before we have to make the switch to orbital boosters. So what we're seeing on screen now are the remains really of what is uh, our first in-flight anomaly of anything that we've launched so far in the career. I was expecting that the third stage would actually be at a higher altitude by the time it was time to kick on the Aero B engine. Turns out I was off by 
enough that the absence of fins caused aerodynamic instability and as a result, well, the third stage basically just broke apart and that was the end of that flight. So in we go to the VAB and we produce a slight redesign. We add some fins to the third stage of that sounding rocket, our silver brand, and we call it the silver brand number three. The goal again with these ones is just to try and get as high as we possibly can on as small as a budget as we possibly can make it and uh, unlock some funds and science for for the X-Plane missions. So what you're seeing here is the construction of the XSP-2A which basically stands for X space plane or experimental space plane. It is not necessarily supposed to be a replica of the uh, famous Bell X-1 which was the first plane that broke the sound barrier in 1947 piloted by one Chuck Yeager. But it is definitely an, a nod to that in its design and its aesthetics. So what you're seeing here is basically me uh, giving the outer shape of what the plane is basically going to be. This is what we're going to be using to break the sound barrier for the very first time and also to try and get as many speed and early altitude height records as we possibly can. It is powered by a single XLR11 engine. Uh, further versions of the plane may or may not come. Uh, in real life, the X1 went through a series of iterations through the X1 to the X1A, B, C, and all the way up to the X1E. And th those planes were really very early takes on, on us trying to figure out how the sound barrier behaves, what causes it to be there, how aerodynamics and fluid dynamics behave at uh, transonic and supersonic speed. These planes really were no slouches. Uh, the Bell X1E in 1953 reached a speed of Mach 2.44 which is really not anything to be uh, to be ashamed about. Those are fairly substantial speeds however uh, the aerodynamics at those regimes were really poorly understood at the time of the X1 and even in the, at the time of the X2 which was the follow-on to the X1 series. The planes could reach incredible speeds, but they were also incredibly um, dangerous at those speeds. They were very hard to control and pilots would pretty much always report back you know, severe instability at those regimes. But they were a necessary part of the growing progress. Uh, they contributed incredibly important bits of information on aerodynamics and how to fly at those incredible regimes. Uh, all of that information that the X1 series and X2, uh, subsequently X3 and 4 and 5, they were all very important contributors to what ultimately would 
become the culmination of the program, which was the X-15, and it would reach speeds of in excess of Mach 6 and ceilings of over 230,000 feet. So what we're doing here is, this is really step one, this is our Bell X1 take. And this is sort of me just kind of being inspired by it as I like to do, to be inspired by real world designs, but kind of bring my own twist and my own spin on it. One of the things that's so incredibly important whenever you design a plane, and this is something that I've I've seen a lot of players make the mistake over is where you locate your center of mass with respect to the center of lift on the aircraft. In real life, the center of mass location on an aircraft always has to pretty much be in the same area. And this is because the center of lift is fixed. It's a determined set value by the aerodynamics of the aircraft. Um, you cannot change the shape or the position of the wings on the aircraft. So the center of lift is where it is. But what you can do is depending on where you set your cargo in the aircraft, you can move it either aft or forward, so either backwards or forwards to basically maintain the flight behavior of the aircraft. You'll see me on a couple of times check the location in this build of the center of mass with respect to the center of lift. You actually want those to be kind of close to one another. Um, using Atmospheric Autopilot Mod, which seriously outperforms stock SAS, that is the way that you want to go about it. Um, it will allow you to have fairly maneuverable and consequently controllable aircraft. If the center of mass is too far ahead of the center of lift, you'll be in a situation where the plane will tend to uh, always want to nose down which is not necessarily a bad thing it creates a natural stability but if you overdo it your plane is basically going to be unflyable something else that's incredibly important as well is uh, you want to be sure that the dry center of mass with respect to the wet center of mass stay basically in the same area. This will prevent any kind of center of mass to shift as the aircraft is consuming fuel. So that's how you obtain constant and good flight profiles on the aircraft. Here we have launch of Silver Brandt version 3. We had a good light on the kick stage. We were fortunate to have a good light on the second stage Aero B engine and a good light on the th third stage Aero B engines. Getting kind of lucky, I guess, I suppose, with these uh, ignition failures, not really not really biting us. Um, yes, I do have test flight installs, but engine failures are a thing. But we were fortunate in this flight to get some pretty important milestones. We hit some altitude records, we hit some speed records, we were able to cross the Carmen line. So the contracts are coming in, that's going to be really important in helping us get that uh, those early research points and funds for our X-Plane program. So with that flight complete, we've got 4.5 science points, so uh, we're going to put those in researching that second X-Plane node. We need that improved cockpit for that altitude capability and also the improved performance of the airdrop. 
we're putting notes or points also in the early rocketry for uh, that's going to give us some improved engine performance that's going to be very important along the way what you're seeing here is the next evolution of the silver brand sounding rocket the silver brand number four there was still some fairly achievable progress that we could easily make just by using slightly upgraded aerobie engines and stretch tanks so we've gone ahead and done that the other thing i was hoping to do here is our previous flight everything got destroyed except the avionics unit so i was hoping to be able to somehow do a repeat performance and this way um, by having that tiny uh, mercury parachute we could hopefully send it to space and back and recover it and get a really early go to space in return At this point, I didn't really think things through too much. I sort of wondered just how far can I get this thing to go? And since the previous flight destroyed itself all but the avionics unit, I figured we could maybe try and get two birds with one stone. Number one would be the downrange contract. Again, I don't know what I was thinking. Um, I don't know why I thought this, this one could ever go that far out my quick maths were really not done well and uh, number two fingers crossed I hope that we could maybe get the same kind of results and get the reach space and return contract So overall, we actually really had a fairly successful flight. Again, we didn't have any engine failures. The Terrabees on the second and third stage ignited really well um, and performed up to depletion, which was again a very pleasant surprise. And we also reached 240 kilometers, which is a new altitude record. So we're going to be collecting a few speed and altitude contracts to go along with those. So overall, so far, a fairly successful flight. Wouldn't you know it, everything stayed intact this time, even though this one went higher and faster. Not sure what happened there, but so it goes sometimes. That is all for episode one. I hope you had a good time. I know I did. There is so much more to do in this series. I am looking forward to it. I hope you had a great time. Until the next time, see you on the next flight.